Hello, and welcome to the second series in the Zay Initiative's Dialogues on the Art of Arab Fashion. I am Emma Farmer, and be your host for today's webinar. We are delighted to welcome back so many guests from across the world to today's dialogue. Today's event is the first of four dialogues to be brought to you in partnership with the Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy, also known as OPCD, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Corporation, Abu Dhabi. OPCD supports and facilitates cross-cultural dialogue through the UAE's network of embassies and missions around the world. Today, we are so excited to be joined by Rauda Alateba, Deputy Head of Mission, UAE Embassy, UK who, with Dr. Reem, will use their personal experiences to bring to life today's dialogue, diplomacy and dress. The format of today's talk will be approximately 50 minutes of discussion from our speakers, followed by Q&A from you all. Please, please use the Zoom Q&A function. Also, please feel free to use the chat function. We love to know which countries you're all joining from, from. Just because we cannot be together doesn't mean we can't share. For those of you joining for the first time, the Zay Initiative was founded by Dr. Reem Almatwali, who with her team worked to preserve the cultural heritage of Arab dress through the collection, documentation, and digital archiving of Arab historical attire and their stories. The goal is to empower and sustain global cross-cultural dialogue. Anyway, that is enough of me and enough of the formalities. Without further ado, allow me to introduce you to Dr. Reem Amatwali, who in turn will introduce you to Rauda. Thank you, Dr. Reem. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I begin by thanking you all for your support and welcoming you to today's dialogue. To make the best of the short time we have here, because I could speak forever on this topic, uh, let me start briefly by explaining the term Zay. Zay is literally the Arabic term for dress or attire, inclusive of adornment of any country or era. Thus, we chose it to be our name. Our goal is to empower and sustain global cultural dialogue, to inspire creative minds to create for a sustainable future, empower women regionally and globally by bringing their untold stories to life, Today, I will welcome a friend and a colleague. Together, we will take you through a short and hopefully joyful journey on fashion and diplomacy. Roda Le'teba is the deputy head mission at the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates in the UK since 2016. She has over 17 years of experience as a diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in international cooperation. She formerly served as the director for the American Affairs Department at the Ministry, responsible for bilateral relations between the UAE and the Americas. She has also served as the director for energy and climate change. She joined the UAE task force for IRENA campaign ending successfully with the UAE hosting the agency. She is a UAE spokesperson on energy, climate change, and sustainability. Rolda is a graduate of the UAE University with a bachelor's degree with honors in political affairs and a master's degree in public diplomacy also with honors. Rolda was the recipient of the professional award from His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2011 for her work for IRENA, as well as the recipient of the Special Leadership Award of 2011. I can't thank you enough, Roda, for joining us for the opening of these dialogues. Marhaba, uh, Alia. Assalamu alaikum, uh, and we welcome you here with us on this talk. And I and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
just want to say I want to welcome you all from the UAE Embassy in London, whereas the weather is so beautiful today. I hope yeah. my Emirati friends won't, won't hate me for this comment. Uh, and I also, of course, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the Public and Cultural Office and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for all their great efforts and Dr. Arim and the Z team for putting together this great event. And I'm looking, as I mentioned, I'm looking forward for today's discussions. It's really great to have this interesting topics when we talk about diplomacy and Z. So yes, looking forward for today. Likewise, and I think we can speak for hours, so I'm trying to make it as short as possible so to get everything down there. The influence of diplomacy networks on fashion circuits has not yet attracted the attention of many researchers in fashion history. Nonetheless, the diplomatic archives conserve numerous documents of diverse types concerning directly the study of fashion and more generally that of taste. As attentive observers of the society of their time and of their contemporaries, diplomats had an official and often political mission. Thanks to marriages, births, dynasty, dynastic events, celebrations of peace and treaties in which these participated in place of their sovereigns. They also served as the intermediaries and indispensable relays in the movement of ideas, people, and fashion. To start with, we will begin with one of my personal favorite images depicting the UAE founding father, the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan. He is in his full UAE national attire and a great symbol of um, national identity. His Highness was very much instrumental, as you know, Roba, in uh, ensuring that the dress code, the UAE traditional dress code continues and is con continuously used to date, till date uh, among individuals and dignitaries and even the ruling, uh, the members of the ruling family as well. Uh, I personally remember him as a child uh, insisting that his own family uh, when they come to greet him, they would be dressed in their national dress. And I remember all the ladies uh, competing in order to put the most beautiful soap that she can appear in front of him to gain his pleasure, to, to show her uh, respect to his uh, wishes. Using this image, I was going to, I want to uh, illustrate basic UAE attire for those who are joining us for the first time and learning about the UAE for the first time. So men in general, they will wear the egal, which is the rope that holds the scarf, the headscarf that is worn underneath it, which is usually called the ghutra. The ghutra comes usually in white, but it can be in different colors depending on the season. Underneath that, men wear something called the gufia, which is a crocheted hat or cap that is, that's placed on the head to help fasten and fix the two other items, the agal and the ghutra. Um, on, uh, on the body, they would usually wear the kandora, which is also called as a thob or tob or dishdasha, depending on where you are in the Arab Peninsula as a whole. And usually it's a tunic dress that is ankle length and generally again in white color, but depending on the season, it could change. In the UAE, it has a particular neckline, which is adorned by a long tassel. Actually, it's a long tassel today, as in, in the old days, it was a very short one but it evolved as you will see most of the dress in the UAE has evolved as it is being used continuously to date and it is called the farrukha. Under that usually men would wear the wizar which is a loincloth that is wrapped on the lower part of the body and, and on top the, the women, the men sorry, will wear um, what we call a bisht which is an overcloak it's a formal form of dress, and it is worn at formal occasions to show respect, 
during celebrations, during weddings and official uh, engagements. Um, it comes in various colors of wool and it's worn according again to the season. And on the feet, they would wear the noon or the leather sandals. I wanted to briefly uh, present this so that people will understand what are the components of male uh, attire in the UAE. Ruda, I know that many of the dignitaries that you come across uh, practice wearing this as a form of identity. I hope, I wish you could shed some light on that. Definitely, Dr. Arim. I just want to start by saying, unfortunately, I didn't have the chance, have the chance to meet uh, his, uh, Sheikh Zayed, the late Sheikh Zayed in person. But you know, Dr. Reem, we grew up listening to his great, the great story about right. his leadership, his wisdom, and his ambitions, which honestly led the country that we see today. And I remember in 2003, when I joined the Foreign Service, it was always my dream that one day I will be an ambassador, inshallah, and I would love to take my oath in front of Sheikh Zayed. And it was always, you know, I picture it, that I will see in his eyes how proud he is of me. And I know despite uh, that dream did not become a reality, I was at least able to see our leadership pride on our, let's say, achievement and success as a woman. And you can see their continued support. So they continue this great legacy of Sheikh Zayed. And uh, talking about uh, the, 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 the customs and what we're wearing at the day, you can see in the official delegation where the prime minister or the crown press, whenever he will go for an official visit, he will wear the, the same kandora, the sifra that you were explaining. And women will wear also the abaya, which is also a formal kind of dress code for Emirati's women. Right. So you can see that there is a continuity of maintaining this great and rich culture within also our current leadership. Very true, yes, this is very true. Uh, when, we, when it comes to UAE women's attire, uh, as you just mentioned, Roba, it is very important to distinguish between public and private dress. I chose these two examples or these images to illustrate the point. On the right hand, as you see, we have an old image by Cordray, uh, and uh, it shows clearly how women uh, appear in very colorful attire. They are using a shale to cover their full body. It's a wider form of shale that used to engulf their whole body. Uh, contrary to general perceptions, the outer cloak or the abaya was not the norm in the past. Why? Because the abaya was a dear article of dress. It, is, it was very expensive and very formal. It was reserved for the higher echelons for special occasions and milestones, for weddings, for distant and seasonal traveling. Uh, while in the, in the, on, the, on the left side, we see the more contemporary form of the abaya as it evolved. It changed from that overall cloak that covered the woman as a whole from head to toe and was used during those special occasions to something that is used on a daily basis. The abaya, due to the urbanization and global exposure, as well as education, has evolved into a robe-like attire. You wear it more like a robe nowadays. And the shela became shorter, or not shorter, uh, nar uh, narrower, in order to be used only on the head part, as you are using it and demonstrating now, uh, Rova. Uh, and it became a public and daily attire because women now are practicing uh, this public life, like you and others. They are, they are entering the workforce. They are entering the educational field. The old abaya no longer is functional for what they need in life. And therefore, they ended up evolving and developing it into something that is more functional to today's way of life. I agree. I, I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Arim. And if you can see, there is a lot of mis conception, stereotype about uh, Arab women or Muslim women. And I think media and people who are kind of being uh, not educated about the culture of these countries will have the stereotype that black is only what we are wearing. And <laughs> believe me, like both of us showing them a clear example how our dress could be colorful, how our culture is rich with colors and we really enjoy wearing different colors. So I just want to clarify three points. 
The first one is again, abaya, the black one is not only our, what we are wearing, it is kind of our dress code for official meetings. And still we're wearing colorful dress. The second one, what I'm wearing is part of my identity. And we always wear it with, I would say pride, and it won't stop me from being educated or powerful or uh, interested to be a minister or an ambassador. So it is, it is part of the culture which won't limit anyone from being or achieving their dreams. My last point is it's really important, and that's worldwide, not to judge each other uh, according to what we are wearing. Uh, uh, respect each other, respect the cultures, and honestly try to engage, try to ask, try to understand how other rich, rich culture is really important. And this kind of dialogue, Dr. Harim, with also the Public Diplomacy Office, this is what we're looking for. So creating the awareness of why we are wearing this kind of custom, why we are wearing the Z, this is what we're looking for. And I think it's really important part of our uh, diplomacy, Dr. Harim. I totally agree, and I'm very inspired by what you said. And just to illustrate your point, our next slide, we have a small uh, video uh, that we will be showing. It showcases the work of a dear friend and a colleague, Lubna Luta. She's a prominent fashion designer who, in my opinion, is very talented in weaving this uh, connection between the present and the past. Uh, she translates her contemporary designs based on a sound understanding and respect to the heritage of the past, which is in direct synergy with the goals and objectives of the Zay Initiative. We are privileged that we have one of her creations. Uh, it is the tolerance dress that she created in 2019 as part of the Zay collection. But this video will illustrate the point that you just made, Roba, to show that women really wear very, very, very colorful clothing despite all the misconceptions that we have over that point. And if we can play the video, please. I think what we can do, Roda, is to take people through the uh, components of the UAE women's attire um, through this um, illustrative slide. Uh, we, we just spoke about the shela, which is the, hair, the head veil that is worn. In, in earlier times, it used to be so wide that it covered the whole body. And today with modernity, it became narrower and it, used, it is used to cover the top part or the head of the, of the female. With it, uh, they used to wear the burgo or the face mask. And we will illustrate that in the next slide as we go on. And with it, they would wear a kandora. The kandora is the tunic dress that is everyday dress that is ankle length. And um, it is embroidered and uh, designed in a specific format, very typical of the UAE with a side slit on the left. On top of that, women also wear a formal uh, gown, which is called a thobe. The thobe is a very sheer and light um, um, article of clothing and it is usually decorated with, the, with what we call telly. It's a traditional craft uh, similar to lace making that, that, is, that uses silver and silk threads or cotton threads to create a specific uh, rope-like um, um, outcome that is then used to adorn uh, the uh, neckline of these dresses. And by the way, uh, in earlier time, this used to be made out of silver and it used to be weighed by silver. 
and therefore it was it is called tola khwar tola and uh, from the indian word tola meaning uh, which is the measure measuring uh, uh, unit of measurement uh, for silver that is used in India. And women used to adorn themselves with it so that they would, first of all, make themselves beautiful. But at the same time, it served as a way of saving. So when the woman is in need, when in her family is in need, she can go and burn the dress and the silver will come out and she would take it and use it to help a, a brother or a son or a husband. So it was a form of saving as well as beautification. And that is what is wonderful about heritage, that everything that people wore, they, they wore it by combining different uh, functions, functionality, climatic change, uh, social st uh, stature, uh, even social cohesion, all filtered into their dress format and what they wore. Underneath the kandora, they would wear a sarwal, which, is, which are the underpants that cover the lower part of the body for the woman. And usually, again, in the UAE, uh, the cuff line of this uh, underpant would be decorated in the silver telly, and it's called a badle. Uh, also, a woman would wear the na'ul, which is the um, sandals, uh, leather sandals that they would wear at that time. I am sure, um, Roda, that you have experienced all these uh, articles of clothing, correct? Of course, of course, Dr. <laughs> Arim. And you know, I remember even my grandmothers, I had an amazing two grandmothers who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But you know, I used to enjoy their stories and maybe two different stories that I remember related to their discussions, which I think you also highlighted, Dr. Arim, which is how family used to inherit jewelry and dress and you talk about the telly. So jewelry was part of the culture that family inherited their jewelries to their different generations and pass it away uh, to, their, to, their, to their kids and generations. And the yeah. other one we spoke about also the telly. The telly is something just to, and again, it's not very clear. It looks like this, which is a traditional textile handcuff, which used to decorate as uh, Dr. Arim said, the woman clothing. It used to be a silver, originally silver uh, kind of thread, so it was very expensive. So certain family will have, will be able, of course, to afford it. But because it was expensive, so also family will inherit it, as you explain, and will, uh, it will pass between generations. But until now, there is a lot of still with this modern life, etc. Still women like this kind of industry and doing all this kind of textile. It became a very uh, famous and very interesting kind of uh, decorations or textiles that also uh, with the modern life we could use it also in our modern style. So I think that the idea of inheriting uh, our cultures and the jewelry is very very interesting concept in UAE that also show how we care about conservation and how we care about keep and maintain this culture uh, generation by uh, generation. You are very right uh, Roda and to add to your point uh, this format also encouraged social cohesion because those who had the wealth and were capable to have abaya, to own abaya, or a, a, a thobe that was decorated in that silver uh, telly, they would loan it to those who didn't have during weddings or special events. And this way they would bond together as a tribe, as a group, as a family. So one would loan their, their clothing to the others to, during these special occasions and create connections and bonds between them. And to illustrate that point, we can go to the next slide where we will show you uh, this image. The Zay this Initiative image. presents this fabulous Burgu Riyasi Bunyum. This presidential face mask was specially created in 1999 by Sheikh Hamda bin Muhammad al Nahyan and gifted to the founder of the Zay Initiative, Dr. Reem Tariq al Matwali. The overall shape of the face mask follows the Yasi style, in direct reference to Yas tribe. The fabric is dyed using indigo, found in grades of bluish to purple, which is then rubbed and burnished to produce a metallic luster. 
the indigo would dye the skin of the wearer blue. For this reason, since the 1980s, masking tape and laterally prefabricated adhesive plastic sheets are placed on the back to protect the skin. The face mask's 18 karat gold embellishments are hand sewn. The top line is composed of 23 round discs that resemble stars and are thus known as new or Nijum. They are followed by another line of larger discs known as Huruf. The burger is fastened to the head using a braided golden metallic cord known as Shibuch. This represents a physical example of the traditional Arabic saying Zina wa Khazina, meaning beauty and wealth in one. The gold was employed to demonstrate style and reflect social status, but could also be melted down and sold in times of need. The Zay Initiative, an ode to the past and not to the future, a collection of Arab dress and adornment, celebrating human narrative. As you see, Rova, in this uh, video and uh, to our audience, we, I wanted to show that the burga, which is a very iconic uh, part of the UAE women's traditional dress, uh, it stood for functionality as an element to protect against the climate, dust, wind, scorching sun. It worked as a face mask to rejuvenate the face as it was infused in indigo which boosts medical and medicinal uh, conditioning properties that help keep the face moist. And also, it, is, uh, and, um, it will accentuate many features such as beautiful eyes, feeding reams of poetry between lovers. And on a cultural level, it was a sign of passage from girlhood to womanhood as girls tended to don this burga at puberty, which coincided with their marriage at the start of their adulthood. With modernity, however, education, urbanization, and globalization, this article of dress has become a sign of the past, upheld mainly by the elderly and sung through many rhymes. Now, I know that my generation were the generation that took off the burqa and no longer wore it. And I don't think you experienced it, Rova, in your generation. You are much younger than I am. So, no, and all Victoria, but maybe now with COVID, we might consider it. As exactly. A female mask. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, you, you cover an important part of the burqa, Victoria. Uh, and what is also interesting is how the burqa size and shape differ between region to regions, different generation. So if you are uh, just a single woman or you are married, you will have a different shape of the burga. If you are a old woman, you will have the big long kind of burga or maybe the dark one. So even the color differ between also different cities uh, in, the, in the UAE. And interesting, uh, another interesting thing I remember my grandmother used to tell me, even you know the thread that um, they use it in the, in the burger, it yes. also differ according to occasions. So if it is a normal occasion, you are just seeing a friends, it will be green or red. But mm -hmm. of course, if it's your wedding, if it is Eid, an important kind of celebration and ceremonies, you will mm -hmm. wear the burger with gold and silver thread. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's nice to see how, uh, I will say people at that time with all the difficult circumstances, but still, they will care a lot about the beauty. They care about, uh, and again, the, uh, as you mentioned, the coherent on the societies, the lending and supporting each other. And so I think the Burga present an interesting stories about women in, in the UAE. Very, very, very true. I, I, I would add to this. Uh, I remember uh, from childhood, Sheikh Osha uh, Shakhbut, the wife of Sheikh Nahyan bin Mubarak, uh, um, she is, she could tell a woman's tribe from just the style of her burga. So when we are in her majlis and, and women walk in, she can identify each woman from which tribe she came or which area of the UAE she has come from to greet her. So these women understood that, uh, again, it's a form of, in my opinion, it's their form of diplomacy. They understood these, um, uh, elements that are unsaid, but they are v visual and can interpret them 
very intrinsically through their culture. True. Yeah. Um, Rhoda, we spoke about this issue of wearing the traditional dress and uh, experiencing different components of the, diff the tra traditional dress. I know you didn't wear, as I said, the burga, but if we go to our next slide, uh, I think you can illustrate to us how your own experience of wearing the thobe, the kandora, and so on. So yes, of course, thank you, Dr. Arim. Uh, as you can see in front of you, a number of pictures of me attending different events, um, either our national day, so usually within our national day celebration in the embassy, we will wear our national dress. And it's not only me, the other female diplomats and even some of our female students will come with our traditional dress. Uh, also, there is a, if you can see the blue uh, dress, I, w I wore that when I went with the, with the ambassador for submitting his credential to the queen. I mm -hmm. still remember the, the details of this day because you know we had to go uh, with a very nice ride with the queen's carriage to the Buckingham Palace. So it was very nice to wear the uh, national dress, to wear the thobe and go to the Buckingham Palace wearing it. And I remember even the queen, she liked the dress and uh, shared a very nice comments about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And in general, whenever a diplomat we receive, usually as a diplomat, when we receive the invitation for any events, it will always ask either you wear your national dress or like the normal dress code, which is suit, which is nice because you, most of people prefer to wear the national dress because it's part of their uh, identity. And mm -hmm. in general, I want just to summarize uh, what honestly the benefit that I witnessed from uh, sharing my Emirati uh, dress. Um, just to say also previously before also uh, joining London, I traveled a lot to South America, to Caribbean islands when I was the director of the American department. And through this experience, I also wear some of our national dress or some, sometimes the abaya. So it was yeah. also interesting to this kind of culture to understand uh, uh, more about our culture. Uh, I will summarize it in three different benefits uh, that sharing the Emirati dress. The first mm -hmm. one is I'll be honest with you, it's always helped to break the ice. So when you come to an event wearing your traditional dress, it's very easy. It always will foster the, the, the discussion, the connection with people. They will come, they will ask you about your dress. It's a good start, you know, to initiate any discussion. So I found it very easy for the communications. And people with different backgrounds will come. It will attract people to come and engage with you. True. The second, I would say, benefits uh, it allow us to also uh, present uh, our creative and innovations kind of side of the UE. Because when they see the details of our dress, they understand and they appreciate all the efforts that put to make this outfit. So right. they come and ask about, oh, you are very creative, you are very innovation. And it's a very good start for me to move from the dress and talk about what we are doing in Mars mission, what we're doing in another important initiatives and innovation mm -hmm. and uh, creativity. The last one, it's also a very good way to educate people uh, about our culture and heritage, because usually I receive the questions, why certain color, why certain material? So it's a very good start to talk about heritage and culture and explain all the different details about our civilizations, about the Emiratis, uh, uh, ethos, etc. So I think in general, I, whenever I will go for an event, definitely my first choice is to wear national dress and I encourage all other court diplomats uh, to do the same worldwide. I, you know, I, I, I am so happy that you said that for two reasons. One, I'm very pleased to see that you are continuing a tradition. And uh, secondly, um, I am very pleased to hear you say all of this because this is the main question that I get when people ask, why, why are you collecting these pieces? Why, what's the point of having something so old? Who's going to look at it? But clothing, dress, attire, jewelry, they all speak on, to many level, on many levels to many people. And from them, you can detect so much about, about a society and about their people. And you have uh, experienced it firsthand because you're doing it as you are, are, you are, you are carrying your daily life through, through your uh, professional uh, work in here. Uh, I too also, I'm happy to say, have uh, experienced the UAE dress. And if we go to the next slide, um, I'll take you through it. Um, I am an Iraqi by birth and Canadian by naturalization, British by education and residence, 
Yet I was raised in the UAE from the age of five, as you see there with Sheikh Zayed. Uh, my late father was appointed by the founding father as the economic consultant to the then Crown Prince Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan. And I'm privileged to have experienced and served in what we term the Zayed era. Uh, I dressed in all, in all my official uh, occasions within uh, the UAE with the UAE dress. And uh, as, a, as a form of uh, uh, respect to the wishes of Sheikh Zayed, so that women would, be, uh, would appear within the, uh, within the um, UAE traditional uh, mode, as, uh, as I took on my uh, official duties for about 30 years as head of the Arts and Exhibition Department for the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi. And ironically, uh, this indirectly contributed to the collection that I amassed, uh, which is the only uh, documented and published body of UAE dress that is now the core of the Zay collection. So this is how the Zay collection came about, because I believed in what you just explained a few minutes ago, and I experienced it many years ago. Uh, and you are now, I, in you, I see a continuation of this, and it makes me very happy that uh, you could uh, grasp the importance of all of these elements, which takes us to the point on jewelry. And I know in particular, uh, uh, you, you are very much involved in all of this, and we'll come to a slide in a, in a few, few, few slides from now, and we'll talk more and elaborate more on that issue as well. Um, so if we go to the next slide, it is uh, interesting that the term gala is thought to have its roots from the Arabic term khila, where it literally refers to a garment that has been taken off from the verb khala, and bestowed upon a person from one to the other. And the Prophet Muhammad is said to have bestowed the mantle burda uh, that he was wearing to the uh, poet Ka'b ibn Zuhair as an honorific gesture. Many rulers certainly bestowed such garments as honorific robes. Thus the term was used to, dis uh, dis uh, to uh, designate any garment bestowed by the ruler upon an official. And court officials were referred to as the men of robes of honor, where honorific gifts have played such a role in diplomacy. Uh, as we see here in this slide, uh, Sheikh Khalifa, president of the UAE, presented Queen Elizabeth II five strand, a five-strand pearl necklace made from natural pearls from the Arabian Gulf. So it shows the point that we were just starting to talk about, and that is the use of jewelry, gold, and traditional elements as gifts of honor that are bestowed and as, uh, how can I say, um, forms of, again, cohesion between countries and between dignitaries and officials and diplomats in order to bridge cultures uh, and represent them at the same time. I wonder if you have come across that, uh, Roba. Unfortunately, with jewelries and gifts, uh, not to the level through my experience in London, Victoria Reem, but uh, maybe perfume and other things that we will highlight in the other slide. But Welcome with the jewelries, and for Fatima. Yeah, so I will take the opportunity to show another slide, and it further illustrates the point uh, that I was speaking of. And uh, it is um, a gift to Um Kalthum by the UAE founding father, somewhere between 1967 uh, 71, uh, in appreciation of her long singing career that mesmerized the Arab world for nearly five decades. This piece of jewelry now uh, was just recently shown at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, and it hopefully will find its home at the Sheikh Zayed Museum when it opens in future. But it illustrates this idea of honorific gifts that are bestowed as a form of diplomatic gestures of goodwill between different uh, countries. You took this thing further uh, through your own uh, interpretation of the idea. And I'm wearing it because you, I just borrowed from you two pieces of jewelry and uh, 
Ashrab here in order to illustrate the point that you're going to make. And if we go to the next slide, we will see uh, Roda dressed in different forms of uh, jewelry. Please go ahead and, and uh, take it over. Thank you, Dr. Reem. Uh, I think what I want to cover here or highlight, which is related to we, the national dress is a way of representing the country, but it is not the only way. So Sorry. there is a different way of presenting the countries. And one of them, as we discussed, the, the jewelry. Jewelry, I really enjoy wearing jewelry whenever I go to any uh, events because, you know, sometimes even though the thobe, it looks fabulous, it's so beautiful, but you know how heavy is the thobe. <laughs> so you yes. cannot wear it and go for all other events. So sometimes definitely will go wearing the modern style, wearing the suit, etc. But it was always in my mind, I still want to show uh, something about my country something mm -hmm. about the culture, even though wearing uh, my, uh, my suit. So if you can see in front of you uh, the pictures of me joining different events and wearing yes. different gold. Uh, one of them is this one, which I used to wear whenever I go to different events. Another one, which is a great initiative of Emirati designer, uh, which also show some of the uh, Emirati's uh, emblem, which is, if you can see, the falcon. So the falcon yes. is a very interesting emblem of the UAE and the pearl, of course. The mm -hmm. pearl was always an important industries. And for example, my grandfather used to be a, a pearl diver. So it's pretty close to our culture. And any mix between jewelries and pearl, uh, it show also the UAE uh, important culture. So you can see that I will always like to wear something, uh, represent the country because that also will uh, initiate a good discussion. People will ask me, what is that referred to? Talk mm -hmm. about the pearl industry, talk about your culture, talk about the falcon as in a UE. And sometimes they might ask me about the color. So you mm -hmm. can see in most of our traditional jewelries, it's either green, red. So I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I still don't have the answer why most of our traditional jewelries come with this kind of uh, game stones. But I think maybe because that was available at that time, uh, and maybe it represents something related to the, to the environment. But this kind of a question is really interesting and it always helps to- Maybe, maybe, make, maybe I can help shed some light on that. That would be great. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, because the Gulf region uh, was very uh, famous for its pearl industry, pearls were, sel were seldom used in jewelry by the women of the Gulf. What happened was it was a commodity. It was a means of uh, gaining uh, economy and commerce. So they sold it and they used it for that reason. And that's why most of the jewelry in the Gulf in past times uh, generally was made out of gold. And these colored are color stones generally are colored glass. Only the very uh, wealthy, like merchants' wives, sheikhs' wives, would own a ruby or an emerald to add to her ring. But in general, for the general masses, they used colored stones that came from India that represent this sort of uh, gemstones. And they, the, they, they saved the pearls, the, the very valuable pearls, to use in their commercial activities around. Uh, what is also interesting is that they, they, they gave a name to each uh, type of jewelry. What you are wearing now is called Maria Omushnaut, which means it's a long necklace that, that ends with a um, medallion. And usually the medallion is uh, a crescent shape because in the Arab and Islamic culture, the crescent is uh, uh, an, a symbol of good fortune, a symbol of a new moon which is because we follow the moon, cal the, you know, the moon yeah. as in, in our calendar. And so when a new moon comes in, it means new luck, new prosperity that would come to the, to the individual or family or the person who's wearing it. And in, the, in rings, they used to give them each a different name and it each had a different uh, finger. So for the ones that you very kindly loaned me, uh, they are uh, worn on the um, ring finger. Uh, and uh, let me start you here. The first, um, the first uh, 
the rings that are worn on the thumb are usually called the chubair, and then we have a shahid uh, on the on this uh, finger. Then it is followed by the marami or murabba, depending on the shape of the ring, and then al hiz. And at the end, you have the chitim. And the reason it's called the chitim, because it's a seal. Usually, it used to have the seal that a, person, a woman would use to sign her name or to sign on a paper or something of that sort. And some men also used to have a seal. And I know Sheikh Zayed, Allah Yerhamma, had his uh, own seal, uh, which is going to be part of the collection of the Zayed Museum in the future, inshallah. So it is wonderful to see that we have all these uh, interesting uh, stories behind this type of culture and behind these uh, elements of jewelry. Again, to beautify as well as to speak about a culture. Yeah. And uh, you took it further, I know. If we go to our next slide, we will see that uh, Roda, if in your particular field, you used an extra element, which is scent. Scent is always uh, tied to our culture, to our background in the Arab and Islamic world. And you took that further, one step further. So could you elaborate for us on that? Sure, sure Dr. Areem. As, as, as I mentioned, we continue with also focusing in our culture, definitely scents and perfume, consider an important element. So the picture in front of you of uh, one of our national day, I think two years ago in the, natural, uh, in the Victoria and Albert, uh, sorry, in Natural History Museum, so the idea was also to show something about our culture, which Hind al were so kindly come and contribute and participate in our national day. And it is to encourage people and guests who is coming to come and create, let's say their own perfume. So they come, they try different perfume, then they create their, their own perfume where they can give them a name, get the perfume a name. So it was a good practice. And people always ask about how the UE are really uh, like the perfume, and you can see even it's a very growing industries. Many families, like even my mom, like she liked to do her, her own perfumes and the dukhun and the other type of uh, perfumes. And uh, beside that, there is a very nice picture, I think, at the top that show um, the gift that Dubai cultures kindly also provided and contributed to the embassy, which is a small box with one toilet or, or of the perfume, we, with, which also we distributed to the guests and we used it in different meetings. So I will go for a meeting, then of course I will give to the, to the guests this kind of perfume. And what, what's nice about this gift, there is a small uh, note inside the box that talk about perfume in the UAE uh, and talk about the cultures and the different, of course, type of uh, smells and perfumes. So I, I found it as a way of also marketing for this important sectors in the UAE or industry. And uh, I, I think people really like it. I didn't uh, give them the Oud because I know how strong, <laughs> is, how strong is it, but of course they, they in general uh, liked the other perfumes. That's true. So from perfume, we go back to uh, dress and we go to our next slide. So as not to miss any stitches in the fabric of international relations, leaders and diplomats attach extra importance to what they wear during diplomatic talks or official visits, adhering to the unspoken rules of what is known as fashion diplomacy. Since fashion diplomacy has become a prerequisite for all the leaders of the global era, what matters most is to adjust diplomatic dress patterns into every single political body without being pricked by the needle of exaggeration. Queen Elizabeth II is famous for adding national emblems to her dress, either on her, with her brooches or jewelry, and uh, respecting cultural as well as religious guidelines. In this, in this slide, I wanted to show that here we see two women displaying many messages by their attire. Both uh, the queen uh, as the head of the Church of England, visiting Sheikh Zayed Mosque uh, in respect of the place that she's visiting. You see her barefoot, you see her in a long dress, uh, you see her with her hair covered uh, as a gesture from her uh, for respect and tolerance to other religions. And then you see Reem El Hashmi, who is uh, one of our young ministers, who is again one of the trailblazing women in the UAE, dressed in her national identity or a national for a dress. Again, 
taking in consideration religious guidelines as well as social and identi identity uh, notions within her dress. Uh, and I wanted to share this with people to show how dress works uh, very closely with, with diplomacy, which is our topic of the day. True. Dr. Arim, just one quick comment. And I think I yeah. also will do the same as a diplomat here. So mm -hmm. I will, usually we receive invitations to go for an event in a church or yes. in a chapel. And of course, for yeah. us, we will always go. I will go to, there was a couple of events before COVID when I went to Westminster Abbey. Uh, Prince Charles came and delivered a speech and there was also a, a different prayer ceremonies. I went with my hijab, I went with my scarves, and of course that is a way of respecting other pe people's belief. And I think tolerance and respect and coexistence today is what uh, make the UAE a very strong and successful country. Right. And uh, just, just want to highlight that, but also diplomats will do the same uh, in different countries that they work in. Very true, very, very, very true. Also, if we go to the next slide, uh, fashion and culture are critical in helping bring people together and bridge divides. When used well, fashion can be an excellent tool for uh, communication, as you said, and to that end, diplomacy. This highlights the importance of strategy and attention when thinking about fashion and diplomacy. It's a, it is a sign that someone has taken the time to find out about the person or the country they are interacting with and gone to the effort to give a little nod to their culture in whatever small way possible. Individuals with influence and public figures must continue to do research and be mindful when selecting their clothing to ensure that they are not sending an unintended message. And then we go to the next slide and talk about Diplomatic dressing is a subtle way to show respect and demonstrate that dignitaries have done their homework. It is a sensitive, delicate, understated and supple way to pay respect to the historical relationship between Britain and, uh, and uh, Pakistan in this example. We see the Duchess of Cambridge first stop during the, uh, uh, her uh, high profile visit to Islamabad College for Girls, uh, to highlight the benefits of higher education and careers for women. She decides to wear a British designer, but within the uh, respect, showing the respect to Islamic dress code, while uh, Prince William decides to wear a um, Pakistani designer, an outfit by Pakistani designer, to show this cultural bridging. We on the, uh, on the UAE side have had many similar experiences and as a Zay initiative, we have worked with Susan, uh, a British uh, fashion designer who was in charge of uh, the dress uh, costumes of all the um, participants at the 48th National Day event that took place last year. And what we were trying to install within that is that a, uh, which we touched upon earlier, to make sure that we use uh, traditional crafts and showcase them in the dress format. They came back and they studied the old dresses that we have at the Zay collection, and they reinterpreted them in a contemporary fashion in order to instill the idea of identity, of being proud of your national uh, identity, of your crafts, of your heritage, and of sustaining them and ensuring that they are used more and more and continuously. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arim, just a quick example here in the UK, yeah. as you know, there is this um, the small flower, we call it a puppy, for Correct. Remember Day. Yes. So usually yeah. as a diplomat also we will wear it during this period, but we show also the respect, to show also uh, the support for all the sacrificed people who died on the World War I. And diplomats yes. usually are encouraged to do that because that's an important uh, example of how also you respect other cultures. Correct. And, uh, and this is a beautiful way to illustrate how you as UAE citizens are participating with the culture in the country that you are serving in. And it's a lovely uh, story to, to tell our audience. Um, if we go to the next slide. Today, we are trying to move away from judging women so much on their appearance. However, no matter what 
view one takes. These high profile women's fashion choices say so much about who they are and what they value. We rarely hear the Duchess of Cambridge speak, but we do see the respect she pays with every minute minute detail of her wardrobe. We see the clear and deliberate messages sent through her choice of wardrobe, a manifestation of something we all do on a smaller, uh, often subconscious level, every morning when we get dressed ourselves. But with dignitaries, the stakes are higher, and it shows how much thought or lack of it was put into a wardrobe or an event. So it is very important to see iconic figures and how they use fashion in order to interpret situations, stands, thoughts, as well as their own individuality. And if I go to individuality, uh, the pressures that public figures face when attempting to strike a balance between individuality and representing one's country. An excellent example is the choice uh, we made of uh, showing Jacqueline Kennedy here. Um, the iconic pink uh, suit that she wore uh, more than six times, culminating with the infamous Texas trip, uh, trip and insisting that she wears it stained after the president's assassination speaks volumes. But Jacqueline Kennedy was a fashion icon, and this outfit is arguably the most referenced and revised of all of her items of clothing and her trademark. There was a long question among fashion historians and experts whether the suit was made by Chanel in France or it is a garment purchased from New York Chenillon. While in, the 19, in 2010, an authorized biography of Chanel uh, resolved this matter by stating that the fabric, buttons, and the trim of the jacket came from Chanel in Paris, uh, and the suit was made and fitted to, the, to Kennedy at Chez Neon in New York using Chanel's approved line-for-line -line system. All of this took place for one reason, in order to appear patriotic to the American electorate by buying her garments from the United States rather than France. So this shows and illustrates how dignitaries and officials go to high lengths in order to support their local, uh, their local industry, their talents, uh, and the economy that surrounds all of that. And these two iconic women really represent that to the T. And I wanted to show it so that uh, we illustrate this point uh, on an international level, uh, not only on a local level. If we go to the next uh, slide, I will uh, elaborate on a local and UAE level. Uh, the UAE itself uh, is a young country and constantly evolving, evolving. Sustaining traditions, crafts, and encouraging talents is clearly at the forefront of uh, their concern. Uh, various institutions and initiatives are continuously mushrooming to fulfill such aspirations. And uh, we at the Zay Initiative are working with artists and the designers to produce cont contemporary products, sustaining traditional. Is the House of Artisans um, that encourage, this is in Abu Dhabi, they encourage the production and training of such crafts to ensure that they continue and be sustained. And IRTHI, IRTHI also is another important uh, initiative that took the traditional UAE telecraft to international level by collaborating with Aspreys of London and creating a line of handbags using contemporary handbags using traditional UAE telework and introducing it on a global level. And I'm sure you experienced working with, uh, with the Earthy, I think, uh, Rola, exactly. correct? Exactly. In general, Dr. Reem, I think what, uh, first, of course, we had good collaboration with, with Earthy because they were the guest of honor in the London Design Fair, I think, last year. And uh, it was an amazing collection showing the different kind of bags and items by Telly and the different chair with the sedu. So it was an amazing, fabulous collection. Uh, and I just want to encourage also other Emiratis entrepreneurs and business to invest in this sector, to invest <laughs> in designing. And why not one day uh, an Emiratis designer for jewelries will collaborate, let's say, with the big jewelry brand 
and we have an amazing like like this one by Van Cleves or other let's say big jewelry brand. So that's what we are hoping for, and we are hoping to see more international engagement. They can help to deliver this story. They can help to clarify and create this better understanding about our cultures, about our the different design, about our rich, let's say, heritage and values. So Earthy was a very good example, and Nama House of Artisan, I think we have a good collaboration with them. Uh, like, for example, um, um, Earthy, they also give us this very nice, as I mentioned, small uh, notebook, which also include the telly. So, yes. more, and this very good explanation, what is this? So this is the kind of very creative way of showing the UAE heritage and culture in a way that could be used also in another uh, different platform. So I just want to thank him and encourage, I think, everyone to yes. also focus on how to, to create more entrepreneurs, encourage them, and business, women business to invest in this, in this sector. Yes, and, and I want to show a small clip. It's Telly, Sefifa, Sedu, Al-Hanna, Al-Bahar, Al-Sadr, Al-Nakhil, Al-Ibal. It just captures exactly what you were just saying, and it shows it on a in such a beautiful artistic format, which which leads to the we have two more points to make because I know they are, we, I'm getting messages saying you're I'm talking too much, so I need to wrap <laughs> it up in a way. Uh, it's this is so interesting, but uh, um, Dubai and the UAE. Is, is now leading in uh, in, in the, this this line of modest fashion and the modest fashion industry. They are creating uh, cities like uh, Design Three uh, District, like uh, creating fairs, creating opportunities for local, regional, and international talents. And it goes and speaks for the point that you were just uh, stating: uh, how we are trying to encourage. Uh, this kind of industry to grow and prosper within the United Arab Emirates and leading it throughout the region. So uh, the point you made, I think this slide speaks for it, which would take us to the next one so that we would wrap up. Never before has the media focused so intensely on women in power, analyzing not just their leadership style, but a woman's right to govern and what she wears. Uh, fashion can be used as a form of empowerment by both designers and consumers. We see here Betty Ford in 77 on the White House table on her first day at the White House wearing a pantsuit, a clear push to women in the workplace. Today in the UAE, we can boast of the number of women trailblazers that are taking positions in all walks of life, from ministers to uh, doctors to educators to uh, designers and so on and so forth. And we at the Zay Initiative will continue to build notes of Arab culture and traditions through the collection of the tangible and the intangible and sustaining their narratives. To mark this, we have created what we call draped in heritage with portraits of 20 trailblazing UAE women dressed in clothing from previous generations part of the Zay collection. Each woman, we captured her within her present work field uh, to show um, their talents or their adherence to their culture and, and, and identity and their walks of life. So we've got from a, from a, a show jumping champion, Sheikha Latifa Al Maktoum, to uh, designers, to genealogists, to uh, nurses, to uh, ballerinas, to space engineers, and so on and so forth. And Rob, I really would hope that uh, with your help and with other partners, this exhibition can pop up around the world in the coming Expo year. Uh, I don't, I, we talked about this, uh, Rob, before, and I hope it will be a dream that we can achieve together. Of course, and, um, and a great, honestly, initiatives. And we are in the embassy in London, I'm sure also other embassies would like to collaborate with you to, as you mentioned, to have this exhibition worldwide, which represent the rich culture of the UAE and the nice uh, Zay and dress. So keen, I'm really so keen and dream about having it one day in London. 
Thank you so much, Rolda, for, and for participating with us today. And thank you, our audience, for your patience. This is a subject that is so dear to my heart, and I can speak for days on it. So uh, I hope you enjoyed our dialogue, and I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. And I'll give the floor to Emma, who's anxious to start questions. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Rauda, Dr. Reem. Absolutely fascinating. I hated to be the one on the other end going, please, please, please keep it moving, because it really was a fascinating discussion. Um, Please keep posting your Q&A. There are lots coming in. I will try and get through a couple of them now. Any that we don't get through now, I'll answer on the email when I send around the recording tomorrow. So, um, so, so, so hopefully we'll, we'll cover them all off in, 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 in one guise. Uh, Rauda, the first question to you, please. As a diplomat, how important do you think arts and culture are in your work? And do you think that the arts and culture should be prioritized by diplomats? Thank you, Emma, and thank you for organizing everything. You are the person behind everything. You take all the credit, you and Gabriella, and yes. Hassa also from the office. Thank you, guys. So uh, I, I think, Emma, it's a, uh, the culture is a very important component of our diplomacy. And that shows also the embassy's engagement with the different museums in the UK. So we always build this relationship with the museum. We try to encourage Emiratis designer artists to come and participate in different exhibitions. And just to give you an example, the last three national days, we, uh, we had it in a different museums uh, in the UK, just to show the collaboration and the interest of the UE in culture. And uh, currently we have a good also a work and collaboration with, uh, with the Science Museum, which also I want to talk about a great initiative that will work, you, uh, work for all our audience to follow. We have what we call the UE STEM, which is a number of Emirati students uh, specialized in STEM in UK. And they created this group which called the UE STEM. And currently they have a very good collaboration with the Science Museum in UK to showcase, uh, talk about the UE STEM. I know we're talking about science here, but I, I think even science would be part of an uh, important also component of our diplomacy in the future. So, um, uh, so this kind of collaboration with the different science museum, uh, different galleries, opening, encourage also designers to come and explore uh, opportunities. So I agree with you, it's an important component of diplomacy. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, Dr. Reem, how do you view non-Emiratis wearing traditional UAE dress? Or how do, how do, how do you both? <laughs> well, uh... The key issue here is that uh, the point that I made uh, while we spoke just now, uh, one needs to be vigilant about um, what they are wearing, whether it is Emirati clothing or any other form of clothing. Uh, a great deal of study needs to be put into one's wardrobe and way they dress. So if you want to represent a specific entity or a, uh, to show respect to a specific culture or the other, Go back and study and understand it and understand their values, understand how they wear it, why they wear it, and try to be careful not to overstep the boundaries that they have. Uh, as long as you do that, I think everybody will be happy if we exchange uh, clothing, styles, and uh, different formats. Emma, if you allow me, I will just want to add one small point when you're asking about the culture and our collaboration. There was a very good initiatives also with the Victoria and Albert Museum, where we also trained a number of Emiratis uh, students to be a tour guide in the museums as part of a preparation for our National Day ceremonies. So we created this uh, important, uh, let's say, opportunities for Emiratis. We took, I think it was a couple of month preparations. And because you want to create um, or build the knowledge of your students or your Emiratis who also have this knowledge about museum, have the knowledge about the different exhibitions, create this awareness is very important also thing. So I just want to uh, add and highlight this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Raudra, another question to you. During the pandemic, how people work, has how people work changed dramatically? How has your work as a diplomat changed this year? So, uh, you know, I took three months off in the UAE. It was a government instruction to go back during the pandemic. It yeah. was a great time and enjoyed it with my family. It was quite time. It, I took some time to honestly start 
reading about new topics. Like, I will be honest with you, for my last 17 years, I didn't have the opportunity to focus on. I enjoyed Ramadan with my family, so it was really great. But you know, diplomacy, as I can see, it requires a lot of human interaction, which we are really missing. So uh, recently, we came with a kind of a new idea where we can also meet in the Hyde Park or another gardens in the UK, and we call it the picnic diplomacy. So I bring the Emiratis coffee, I bring some snacks, I bring harissa, arsia, any kind of Emiratis uh, food. I will bring it in a nice gathering in the gardens and invite friends, sometimes parliament MPs, sometimes think tanks representatives, sometimes business friends. And we will chat about different things with respecting the social distancing in the outdoor space. So yeah, that's a nice initiative. We did a couple of interesting gathering and I think we will continue until it's too cold in London to have any more outdoor gathering. Well, we're I'm lucky that this week we've had a wonderful, wonderful True. Weather. True. Um, Dr. Reem, another question for, for you before, before maybe you could do a little summary of this fascinating chat and then, and then, and then we'll, we'll call it. Are perfume connected to tribe, region? Jewelry as political statement has been in the news recently with Michelle Obama's vote necklace. Is this a thing in the diplomatic world? Is this for me? Uh, this is for and me. This is for you. Oh, you, you mentioned yeah. diplomatic world, so you threw it. <laughs> uh, okay, Sorry. scent. Uh, scent is, um, you know, scent has a long, long history in the in the area because of the type of uh, life, the Bedouin life, this uh, this uh, unsedentary life that Bedouin carries. Uh, you move in a sp in specific climates. You 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 are exposed to the elements. Scent has always been. Uh, a, a key instrument in, in uh, rituals of, uh, of the area. And uh, in the UAE and the rest of the Gulf states, uh, there are actually certain rituals for scents. For example, uh, when, before you leave your home, you have to be scented and perfumed as well as uh, use the bukhur, which is the incense part of the scenting. And then when you go to somebody's home, the first thing they do when you, they, you come in as a sign of welcome they present you with with some wood and uh, they perfume you before you leave they bring it again and they serve it to you so there is a very meticulous and detailed and beautiful rituals that accompany the scenting uh, system now it varies from one region to the other with some specialities here and there but as a general rule it is always uh, it's it's a shared tradition around the whole area. I don't know if you would care to elaborate more, Roba. I totally agree with you, Dr. Arim, and I covered, I think, the scents and perfume previously. So mm -hmm. it's an amazing way of representing the countries and the rich culture of the UE. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. Wow, just, just fascinating. I think, I think we could be here all night. Um, Sam <laughs> Or all night here in Dubai, all morning there in America, because I know we've got many people from America also, also joining. Rada, all it leaves me to say is thank you so, so much for joining us today. We're so excited. We've got three more talks um, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Corporation coming up in the next few weeks and months and more details of those will, will, will be with you. Uh, for Dialogues on the Art of Arab Dress, uh, Patricia, artist Patricia Milnes will be joining Dr. Reem on the sofa on the 6th of October uh, for inspirational adornment in her practice. So please join us, please register, have a fabulous day or evening depending on where you are in the world and where you're located. Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's a pleasure. Really wonderful. Have a nice pleasure. evening. Thank, Thank you, everyone, and thank you to the audience. Thank you so Bye-bye.